Okay, so uh, Richard Harold, as I said, I have a quite a long job title, but part of it is accreditation. So um, anything to do with uh, WASC for our Doha school or NIASC for our UK schools generally starts on my desk, and then I try and um, find the appropriate people to help me with it. So we are, in two of our schools, we're still in the eighth edition. We've, uh, I, I guess the next conversations we'll be having with NIASC will be about the ACE transition. We've had our journey complicated by some administrative changes, new head of school coming in who has a very British independent school background and uh, we've been sort of teaching him a little bit more about how international accreditation works. Um, bright guy, um, obviously you know, open-minded so I don't see any potential for problems there necessarily but uh, it is a different language because uh, the instant association for most British heads is to think it's an inspection um, and there are certain criteria we have to we have to meet and the idea that actually ACE is about a journey and there's really no wrong answers when you're starting out um, is a bit of a new idea so that's one of our campuses um, another campus we're just finishing with uh, the first year of our head of school but he is a man with international experience he's come to us I believe from Tanzania was his last job um, and so uh, a lot more experience there and that that does help a lot um, he needs much less of a a, a, a guiding hand as we're going through the process and introducing things. And then we have our Egham School, which is, uh, it's already gone through the Learning Principles visit. Um, we're going to be hosting our ERV in December. And I guess a bit later on in this panel, we'll be talking about the specifics of how we arranged it. But uh, again, it really helps to have um, a, a large number of the senior leadership team, the SLT as we refer to it, with international experience, not just British school experience and that, that actually is a, a, a very distinctive characteristic of that particular campus that almost everybody in the senior leadership team has international school experience so that was a, that was a tremendous help. Um, so that's where we are in the journey. We're December we're going to have our uh, ERV at the same time as not just the IB visit but the IB modified self-study visit. I don't know if you're aware that there's a, there's a pilot uh, scheme to try and reduce the amount of committee meeting time that schools uh, have to do because you, you kind of recreate these committees with the same personnel to more or less you know, do similar jobs. You know, if, you're, if you're doing an IB authorization and you've got heads of uh, department and you know, assistant principals in the room talking about that process and that same group convenes the following week to talk about the NIAS process, there, there really is a lot, of, a lot of room to save time in that. So the IB have recognized that and they've created a modified self-study with uh, <coughs> reduced paperwork and we're one of 13 pilot schools around the world trialling that and that will be in December so I'll let you know how that goes this time next year but uh, I'll hand over for now. So as mentioned um, I'm director of a school in Malawi which has got some significant challenges uh, to say the least. Uh, we've been through a learning principles visit we're now preparing for our full um, ER visit uh, which will be in November 2019 because we've actually asked the IB to come and play nicely with CIS uh, and NIASC so we'll have a fully synchronized three-way visit um, so the only time that that could be possible was actually a bit later than the, the traditional within a, um, you know, a short time after the learning principles visit but we'll have a fully synchronized visit which will be kind of exciting. Um, just a little perspective from me because we've uh, We've been with the 8th edition and with the ACE um, being very different to the CIS um, new protocol, uh, we're very aware that we can be spending an awful lot of time tied up in administrative functions and meetings and really just chasing a tail and, and that's, that's a big question for us. Uh, what value do we get from all of these different accreditation processes? Um, and I will say right off the bat that we've found that going through the CIS, uh, yeah, it's beneficial. You know, we're, we're showing that we're doing what we need to do, but the conversations, the real conversations, have come about from the ACE protocol and from the whole school. You know, all of the, the, the teaching staff have been fully engaged with those conversations. And it's that that's really made the difference within our school in terms of moving it forward. 
Um, and I, I think that says a lot about what ACE is about. It is really moving the school forward. Um, we've still got a way to go. We, we've actually finished pretty much all of the documentation for the ACE. Uh, we've got a couple of committees still to run with the CIS. We're well ahead of the game. Um, but we've been quite prudent in the way that we've established these committees and get, you know, trying to get the biggest bang for the buck out of uh, what we do with the teachers. Their time is valuable. They've got plenty of other meetings to go to. We want to make sure that all of the meetings are really focused around learning. And just as we've seen the exercises today, you know, using T diagrams and flip charts around the walls and people going around, we've done that with our um, learning principles as well. And that's really had an impact, I think, in... Uh, helping teachers to understand what it's all about. And, and one of the video interviews um, I did yesterday, uh, the gentleman, I forget his name, said, you know, the main thing is the main thing, and the main thing is learning. That's what we're here for, not to have endless meetings chasing a tails for, for conformity. We've got to have things that are really going to move the kids forward in their learning. And, um, yeah, I look forward to your questions. So I'm Devin Pratt from Frankfurt International School. Um, and when we started about, I guess it was, uh, I went to a, a, a conference in Rome where uh, Peter was there and learned about for the first time, we took a group of people, learned about the, the learning principles and the ACE protocol and decided right away that we were going to try to make, try to blend our strategic planning process, which we had had for a number of years. It's a three year a rolling strategic planning process and use the learning principles to be the guidelines kind of for us for that work and um, so and then also knowing that we had our accreditation coming up so we started doing that and we became more familiar with it uh, with the, the process and started to learn and I would say that was mostly just a leadership group that did that not so much the teachers at the time um, except for the ones that were most closely related to the or working with the strategic plan but then uh, we did our learning principles review in um, September. Um, before we, as we sort of were trying to decide how we were gonna do this, we were, we were CIS accredited previously, but we were also moving with the IB to try to be accredited with the IB careers program. And so as we sat down and looked at it, we realized that we also have two campuses, so we have two PYP programs, and we realized that if we did CIS, NEASC, and IB, that we were gonna have seven visiting teams in an academic year. And it, we just couldn't do it. So we, we, so we decided not to use CIS. Uh, we still have a great relationship with them, and, and maybe we'll use them again in the future. But uh, we decided not to do that. And actually now, uh, looking back, it was quite it was a good decision because it's helping us uh, to make sure we get our U.S. accreditation. We've had a long-term relationship with NEASC. Um, in fact, uh, Paul Pachman, our director, sits on the NEASC board. So... Um, so we had lots of connections to NAS, but so we did our learning principles review in September. We have our uh, ERV coming up this coming September, um, and we've been processing throughout the year trying to make sure that we're blending both uh, the IB. We are also a pilot school for, 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 um, for the IB synchronized visit, um, and so we've learned a lot that way. I mean, one of the, I've been learning ever since we first uh, got into this, but one of the things I, I learned since I've been here and I'm excited about it, is the fact that when you get your accreditation, it actually comes with a lobster dinner by the sea. So I'm looking forward to that uh, in, in sometime next year or so. There's so much to ask them and I have a feeling we may not get through all of these questions. So I'm gonna to jump to something kind of a really important point. Uh, which is, as you've gone through your internal reflection and gotten to the point of coming up with some really key major learning plans for your community, how did you get to that? Pro how did you get to that place where you could start to prioritize those major learning plans? And could you give, give us an example of, of something that has risen to the surface for you in the process? You may go ahead and start. To, okay, um, we just did this, so, I'm, so I'm, it's very fresh in my mind. We had a community. Uh, uh, strategic planning day and by the time we got to that day we had already processed um, all the survey data which we did with all the faculty um, and then we had in our in our teams AC and a we broke we we organized ourselves much like uh, NIA suggests and then we had a data organizer for AC and e and we had a writing facilitator for AC and e um, and through that process we came up with what we saw as uh, we, we, for each of the learning narratives we had, uh, each of the learning principles we had learning narratives, and we had all the feedback that got us to some st strategic initiatives that we hoped that 
we would be moving forward on. But then we have those further processed by um, and by the by community representative of parents, students, um, and out of that we came up like one of the ones that came up to be specific would be that um, we want to create a culture of uh, coaching, and not just uh, we, you know we want we see it as uh, because it's all learners. So one of the things is that we're talking about is that we're starting with the admin team, the leadership, the adcon. We're going to be uh, modeling this by getting by uh, engaging with coaching, and uh, at the same time, we're also getting teachers to try to think more about being facilitators. Um, one of the things that helped us get there was, um, and it was a question that we had that, with, with, that and it was we kind of struggled with this at the beginning because when you go out to do right learning narratives for the for the external review you typically in your own school are going to look for kind of positive things. You're not going to be going out and looking. You know, most of us know where the pockets that we want to work on are. So we had a little bit of trouble thinking as we started to do these learning narratives, like how is that going to help us figure out where our growth areas are? <laughs> so the way we kind of started to think about it was the learning narratives were sort of the positive things we saw. That was the promising practice that we wanted to attain or have more of because there are pockets of it in, in you know, and, and we're a well-established school, so we have quite a few you know, superstars and really good uh, examples. But then we also have, like all schools, areas where we know uh, pockets where we can grow more. So then we use the continuum and the conversations we had around the continuum as the faculty process that to say this is where we are, this is the promising practice we want to be, um, and then so th therefore what is it that we have to do to be able to get to that promising practice. And that's where the, the culture of coaching was one example that came out. And so now we're starting to develop uh, specific action plans that will get us to uh, to have that be come to fruition. Sure. Yeah, fairly similar. We've got a slightly, uh, quite a similar timeline as well because our ERV sounds like it's going to be about two months after yours in in December. Um, I guess uh, a couple of things we've we've tried uh, as far as a wide strategy is concerned to get as many of our our folk trained as ACE visitors themselves. Um, that was one of the initiatives that uh, Jeff was able to um, help us with by being a host school. We actually had uh, two days of training in May 2017 where one of our campuses, the one that's going to have the ERV visit in December, hosted um, for largely internally. I think we had a couple of people from Rygards in, in, um, in uh, Denmark as well, but it was largely internal. The, very, the following day, which was a Saturday, we did it Friday, Saturday, uh, we, we widened it and we had something like I was, I mean, 40 people, wasn't it, in the room? Yeah, 42, six of whom were from ACS and the others were from all over the place. So obviously that was, that was great for us to be able to offer that, but the, the discourse is enriching because like, like you were saying, Devin, you kind of focus it. You know your school. You know what you you know kind of work. If, I, if I'm being honest with you, we know that our use of the map tests in one particular campus is pretty much cosmetic. You know, the, the the data isn't really used to inform student learning in a way it could be. So we're we're very much at the um, not yet evidence stage with that particular aspect of our of our support. So that's something we know we know is a weakness. We're doing what we can you know with an appropriate timeline to coach that along. If you take that conversation out and you're talking to a school from Russia or Iceland or Germany, there are, you know, there's no expectations there. They don't know what your individual story is. So you, you have those wonderful conversations that are probably as rich, if not richer, during the coffee break or the lunch break as they are during, during the learning sessions. And you know, Jeff would stand there and talk about um, you know, the, the four C's or something, and we'd all be translating that in our, in our tables to our individual context and trying to come up with something that was those conversations were tremendously enriched by having somebody with, from another school at your table. So what we've ended up with is, yes, we've got our, our action plans. In particular, I think the one that uh, the visiting team in December is going to be seeing is a vast improvement in our student support services. That, that's been a major focus. So obviously there's a learning principle in, involved there. But more importantly for us, we, we've tried to take it out of, you know, we're not just jumping through a NIAS coop. This is something that needed to be done if we're going to be true to our mission um, to what we call the ESLRs, the Expected Student Learning Results, which actually comes from WASC, I think, originally. Um, we've kind of adapted them. So if we're saying we want our students to be, one of our phrases is um, we want them to be, uh, I'm trying to think of a, an appropriate one for learning, Let, let's say a, a, a contributor. We, we say caring contributors. And that's everybody. That's not just somebody who can read and 
read, read, you know, read the pamphlet and, and talk the jargon. That's your EAL student who's just arrived from Romania and isn't yet ready to speak English. They can still be a caring contributor to the, uh, to the organization and to our mission. So it's about, I guess, nourishing those conversations and making them meaningful. Uh, I've kind of now exposed ourselves to you know, potential weaknesses in December because we're not going to be there. But the wonderful thing about ACE is that you don't have to, you know, you, you have to sort of say we, we expect to be here on this journey. And if we're still talking about it or thinking about it, that's okay. That's absolutely okay. And, and for us, that's been a bit of a shift because before when there was a numerical scale associated with it, we all go back to how we were as middle schoolers, don't we? You know, I got a B plus, what did you get kind of thing? Um, that's not what ACE is about. And I think we've, we've, we're now able to say we've got that message across to our communities. <coughs> From a school leadership perspective, uh, I've got a slightly different lens on this. Uh, I alluded to the fact that I don't want to make work for work's sake and that uh, I want to have the dog wagging the tail, not the other way around. Um, so what we've actually done is an iterative process with the board, with the faculty, um, really trying to hone in on what do we value. So we're not valuing what we measure, we want to try to measure what we value. And first we have to have a lot of conversations about what do we truly value within the school. Fortunately, a lot of that aligns very closely with ACE. It doesn't align necessarily with um, the other accrediting bodies, but with ACE, it very much is, is firmly there. So we've had a lot of very um, focused conversations about what do we value, and as a, a corollary to that, how could we measure what, what impact will we see as a result of uh, these things that we truly value within the school. And the big learning for us in the last um, few months really has been a focus on learning. Um, we've been through the process with the faculty and, and board to try to define learning as, as all schools have to. But that was really quite a revelation for us to get the faculty to agree on a definition, not just examples of what learning looks like, but actually what it is. Uh, and our realization is that the IB is so full of jargon and that the parents, the, the, the staff, yeah, they, they get the jargon, the, the kids get the jargon, but a lot of the time the parents and the board, they take so long to get up to speed with what the IB really is about because it's obfuscated, the, the jargon gets in the way of everything. Um, and teachers fall into the trap too easily of coming out with these words and phrases from the IB. Um, and frankly, if you're a non-native English speaker, and as Peter pointed out, you know, the polysyllabic... What was the word? Polysyllabic? <laughs> uh, yeah. Polysyllabic. Polysyllabic, there you go. From a German speaker te teaching an English <laughs> speaker. Um, it's crazy the amount of jargon that is in the IB that's getting in the way of learning. So our focus over the last few months has been really looking at learning, but finding a common language of learning uh, and finding a common language of what we understand you know, will be evident in the classroom. Uh, and that is really part of our um, target setting, is to strip away all the needless jargon and to try to focus on what's important. So that the kids and the parents and the teachers, they can all be on the same page and that our governing body will understand when we're talking about what's happening around the school. Deborah, I have a hand, yes. Um, so, Steve, you mentioned evidence. How did your school actually use evidence um, in the process to figure out where you were? Uh, I know, you know in, in past processes, you would look for evidence to prove the rating that you had given yourself. Did you use evidence in a different way in this process? Okay. <clears throat> well, we, ha we have to be honest here, right? So um, I think I, I didn't see any great change between how we did the preparation for the learning principles visit. I wasn't necessarily in, in control of the process because we have a um, this, the senior leadership team is the structure. So if you imagine a room with 12 people meeting weekly, and they would meet weekly anyway, but when you've got something like the, you know, the ERV preparation or more, more significantly the, the learning principles visit, I say more significantly because that was the first time we really got down and dirty with, with you know, what we had to do for ACE. Um, so they're meeting with a specific agenda, and there, there were plenty of evidence conversations. And we'd, we'd basically have about, I think the committees were about five in number, and so each, each of the 12 
people who were around the senior leadership team, they, they were sort of given, they were, you know, 10 plus 2, as it were, you know, we had two floaters. And then we realised that we'd omitted the curriculum coordinators. So those of you in IB schools realise that that's quite a significant <laughs> part of the learning um, structure. So they were drafted in as well, and we had, for the, for the purpose of preparing for the learning principals visit, we had an expanded senior leadership team. Um, so it was the 12 people who were in charge of things like you know, the divisional practice and the facilities and admissions and, and, and special needs, and then the curriculum coordinators came in. So there, were, there was plenty of expertise to go around. Those conversations, as I say, would be, they, they'd be looking at student work. And actually, that, that's actually a little bit on the side. But when you've got the Dean of Admissions contributing to what is effectively a, a moderation discussion, so you're looking at high, middle and low levels of student work in middle school, that is a, that is a perfectly legitimate activity. It was, it was amazing because it's not, you know, she's a Dean of Admissions. She's not actually you know, a full-time educator. But having that extra perspective was really surprisingly useful. It was amazing what people can contribute. We didn't get as far as introducing the bus drivers to that as well, but it, it, was, it was a marker that, you know, our, when we say learning community, it really isn't just the people who are traditionally in education roles. So that was, that was quite important. Now we move on, you know, about a year, let's say, to the, the, um, uh, the preparations for the ERV. And if I'm honest, there hasn't been a whole lot of significant change in our use. The use of evidence has probably dropped in, in terms of having student work there, but they are still informed by that, uh, that need for objective... Pre you can't just say something and be unchallenged. You know, you've got to be able to back that up. And I don't think I would have noticed that. That wasn't a conspicuous part of 8th edition conversations. That was much more about, OK, we've given ourselves a three, you know, what, what are we going to show the team? Um, and that's that's not really what ACE is about. We come back to that numerical scale thing. Does that answer the question? Yep. Just perhaps to add to that, um, if if what was important to us was trying to um, find a measure for what we value, sometimes it's quite difficult to 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 get that information. A lot of the time, we reached out for surveys and feedback from the students. So, for example, if they were involved in service learning programs. Um, yes, we can get raw data on how many you know, went above and beyond and did all sorts of wonderful things, but how it really impacted the students. And a lot of the time that came down to um, small-scale surveys, large-scale surveys, uh, anecdotal stories from the students. If there's, you know, if, if, uh, it's very easy to pick the high flyers and just use them as exemplars. But... The, every school will have high flyers, but if you can pick a selection or, or pick children at random, and if they're coming forward and saying, I really got a lot out of doing that work with you know, this organization or what we were doing in this particular project, then even though it's not completely systematic and it's not necessarily uh, all-encompassing, that random sample in some ways is more effective than just picking out the top flyers who are going to excel whichever school they went to. Um, and so we're actually trying to look at, you know, Joe Bloggs' average student, are they getting some kind of value added from being part of this program? And we could get bogged down in trying to devise systems. We've got a small school. I haven't got the staff that can spend hours and hours trying to coordinate across the whole school with surveys. So these little vignettes are as powerful for us, and we've found that to be um, a good way of informing us on a realistic data basis, but it's not necessarily a full statistical analysis, but it's still giving us a good lens through the eyes of the students what kind of learning experiences they're getting, and we can then build that into our um, ACE planning. I think maybe the thing to do is talk about the kind of data we looked at. Started with the survey data. We've always given surveys, but one of the things that this offered us an opportunity to do was actually have everybody dive into the results instead of just the ad con. So we set up processes so that it gave people a chance not only to dive into the, the survey data, but at the same time to start to develop an understanding about the learning principles and, and what they meant. Um, so we, we looked at that survey data. That was helpful. The, the conversations are much different than if you're just looking for, like, okay, well, where's the evidence that we have uh, a social studies curriculum and where's the evidence that we have uh, some of the stuff that are part of the foundation standards? 
So that was a that was a good part of the conversation. The other thing that we did is we decided to have uh, not a large group, but uh, the everybody that was on the 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 the, the creating teams A C and E. We did a data in a day, and it actually we're a big school with two campuses, so it was really data in a lot of days, but a uh, number of days. But w what they did is they went out and, like a visitor, like we would be doing when we go to the school, went out and observed and interviewed kids and talked to teachers, and then that's where we got our learning narratives. That's where they, we started to create the learning narratives from that. Um, and then and then those learning narratives, as I said before, became sort of that promising practice. But the kind of evidence we're looking for, because it's more qualitative, and because we had people a, a part of it, it was a conversation then about learning instead of just about well, what what you know we're not trying to prove something, but more about trying to decide kind of where are we uh, in in any one of the the ten learning narratives. So it does change the nature of uh, of, of the conversations. Um, I'm guessing that you are probably starting to have some questions of your own in your head. So I'll ask them one more open-ended question, and then if you want to be thinking about a follow-up question that you may want to ask, I would like to know um, what advice would you have to schools who are just entering the process? I'll go ahead, but um, one, one that uh, Richard mentioned is if you can do, uh, if you can host a visiting, uh, a visitor training, that was really helpful for us too. We did the same thing, and as a result of that, we've had five people go out and do visits. Uh, and they've brought that back, and in their departments, and you know, and and with us, that we started to develop that understanding. Um, the other thing is uh, that I I would suggest is once you know your kind of what your timeline is, is sitting down with the people that are going to be leading it, and I would say take a couple of days just to work backwards from when it is you think the visit's going to be, and to really plan out uh, how you're going to do how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it. We tried to use time that we already had scheduled, so faculty meetings, professional development days we use. We, and, and by the way, it is professional development to be having these conversations. You don't necessarily have to have somebody come in that's a guru on some sub subject. Uh, we did it in-house, and it was very, in fact, as a matter of fact, some of the feedback we got that, uh, from the surveys we did at the end of the, the sessions was that, and, and this is from some uh, upper school teachers, said it was the best PD they had had in years. So it was, that was, that was uh, confirming. But to really plan ahead, I mean, and, and the kind of the way it happened with us, we started doing IB separately and, uh, and then NEAS by itself in two streams. And then we decided to join the pilot after we kind of started that. So it did make it more complicated because we had a really good plan and we had to just kind of tear it up and start over from scratch. Uh, so, um, so just making sure you kind of plan it out because it is, it is time consuming uh, for sure. So. Yeah, I, I went with a coordinated chaos theory. Um, rather than having, you know, s uh, senior leaders in each of the committees that were going to be the chairs and nail everything down and appointing chairs, um, I took a slightly different approach and basically put people in a room and you're all adults, you're all professionals, you all know what you're doing, you know, here it is, get on and work it out. So rather than appointing chairs, and with that comes a certain level of you know, officialdom and, oh, you know, I've got to be doing this. And it, it actually worked well to not have a chair structure. It worked in our school. doesn't mean it'll work in every school. And I just wondered whether we, within the ASCA, are doing enough to explain what some of our jargon actually means, because we've got our jargon mm -hmm. as well, or whether there is enough already for schools to be able to pick up the ball and run with it. In other words, should there be more initiatives from us to clarify our language, or is there sufficient there for schools to be able to do it themselves? I have in mind particularly schools that haven't been lucky enough to host a workshop, so they haven't had that conversation opportunity with people from other places, and or schools where the dominant language is actually not English. Yeah. So I do wonder whether you feel we, we should be doing a bit more, or whether we can leave it the way it is and let schools get on with clarification. Can I, can I address that one? That's, that's a fantastic question, Jerry. I, I know you're in, in Spain. Um, I, was a, I was interviewing for a job once at a school in Monaco, which is a bilingual school that was just coming out of the PYP. They dropped the PYP. I think it was part of the political 
uh, conversation between the school and school administrators, but they still had the posters up, and it was a bilingual interview, so I thought, well, this would be good for me, and I'll, I'll sort of refresh my French. I read all the learner profile uh, posters in French, and I found that really helpful because there are just subtle differences in, in the connotations between French, Spanish too, um, and, and the English translations. And I thought, oh, that, that's really handy because it's forcing me to think of the, 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 the jargon in a different way. It gives me a, a slightly new perspective on it. When, when I, got, I got back to, um, well, I ended up in ACS, of course, not Monaco, and I, we, we have uh, the IB in all of our schools, at least at diploma level, and in two of our schools we do, we do the, the through program, and in one of them we do the, the careers program as well. So there, there's that jargon-rich atmosphere. But actually the most useful thing for us was the, the simple act of defining learning. Um, we took our time over that. Um, and, and I think if you walked up to any member of certainly the academic staff and asked them, to, you know, what's the ACS definition of learning, they'd be able to tell you it's growth and development in uh, knowledge and understanding, skills and dispositions and it was that last bit that caused all the fuss as you can probably imagine you know um, because assessing dispositions is extremely difficult and of course any any definition of learning is then going to provoke the question okay great now how do you measure that and you know how do you measure honesty how do you measure integrity there are ways um, but they're messy uh, they're qualitative and they're uh, for me that's that's the beauty of it um, so you know the word learning isn't necessarily jargon but it still needs to be unpacked, it still needs to be explained. I, I think I always, I, I found that having that sort of, not quite empirically grounded, but certainly semantically potent common language was very helpful to us, and that took a long time to develop. But as I said, now, you know, you, you'll be able to catch me out, truly. You can walk around and ask any ACS members what, what our definition of learning is, but I, I'm pretty confident most of them would, would, would give you that answer, because we arrived at it as a community together. I just wanted to ask, uh, because you schools that have more than uh, one accreditation, did you, were your teams mixed so you had the same people in the room talking about learning in the PYP and learning in uh, the DP? Uh, were you using common language regardless of the jargon of any of the accrediting agencies? Certainly from our point of view, we've been trying to strip out the language of learning away from the IB programs, um, so it's, it's independent of CIS, ACE. Um, in, inevitably, I think we're driven by the ACE protocol in terms of our learning because of the lenses that we have to look through uh, and kind of addressing Jerry's thing. It does take people a long time reading the learning principles and getting the head around the impacts and really what does that mean? That takes some time. Um, but we've, we've kept the IB conversations separate from the learning. Uh, and so for us, we've had um, you know, meetings focusing on the, the learning principles and separate meetings that have to look at the IB uh, hoops that they have to jump through. Uh, one of the things we tried to do was a little bit different because I said we started with two streams. We had people working on the IB, people working on ACE. Then we pulled them together. But what we realized was we still needed somebody to write the part of the IB, uh, what, they were, they were, what they were asking for. So we asked the PYP coordinators and the diploma coordinator. They did that work. Uh, with the, but, but a lot of the information that they had, they drew from uh, the work we were doing with ACE. But the other thing that we did was every document that we created, we challenged ourselves to make sure that we were talking about both learning principles and that we, and typically it was learning principles first, but then we would uh, talk about, well, how do we, how do we tie IB to this? Where, do, where is the overlap? So for example, when we were out looking at learning narratives, uh, you would be, we started with the learning principles. Uh, so if you were looking, let's say, at um, number three assessment as of and for learning, then you would, uh, you would look at that, but then at the, as a part of the process after you had found examples and written a, a learning narrative, maybe interviewed some people or took a video, or then you would look at the learning, uh, the learner profile, and you would discuss, you, and the way we did it was we had people just highlight, like here's the three uh, tenets of the learning principles, I mean the learning profile that, uh, that, that apply to what we've seen here. Uh, and then when we did the writing, we actually wrote it into paragraph form, like to say, you know, that this, what we, what the evidence we saw here would tie to whatever the learner profile 
than it was. So uh, we were able to kind of constantly keep it blended as much as possible. Well, very similar actually to what Devin's just said. I would, would just add one thing, because um, you can obviously tie yourselves in knots trying to draw through lines between different curriculum. Um, I think one, one thing that was helpful to us and certainly helpful to the person in the role was in, in all three cases our curriculum coordinators were new to role, in one case new to school this year. So writing that aspect of the report was a really handy way of introducing them to the school community and they had a complete license to go around and talk to obviously the teachers but more importantly the kids and to some extent the parents too, especially if it's a staff parent, obviously we have that luxury. Um, the other thing was there were two policies that were developed this year that were also from the ground up and they were, I mean, they're IB required policies, one is academic honesty or academic integrity and the other one was uh, language policy. So being at the, at the helm of those new policy initiatives was also, was also quite useful. Okay, we'll take one more question. How long from the time your school started studying the learning principles and understanding them or with what rapidity, or lack thereof, when did you start seeing change in classrooms hmm. after you started working on the principles? Okay, so our Oh, no, less than a year, way less than a year. Um, in the case of ACS Egham, um, we had our first full faculty meeting on in January 2017, which would have been something like the 8th or 9th of January, I dare say. We had two days of in-service before the kids came back, um, and we just presented li literally, you know, the, the, the graphics showing that, okay, there's the, the A, the C, and the E, and what they stand for, what they mean, and we, we kind of got a bit stuck on the foundational principles. I would have rather spent time on, as foundation standards rather, I would have rather spent time unpacking the 10 learning principles. But that was, let's say, January. By spring break, we were able to see, um, I, I wouldn't say, you know, profound change, but we were in gear. We were starting to move, the people were using the language, they were starting to say, okay, um, this, is, this is more serious than just an incremental increase, you know, and the clock's ticking because we've got a visit from well, actually, Trillium, you were there, weren't you? <laughs> um, coming in, was it September, and October? Allison, and Alison, of course, that's right, sorry. Yes. Yes, um, I, I sat in with your interview with September. the middle schoolers, and I was praying for you in the corner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would say that I, I was satisfied that, yeah, we're on track by about spring breaks. So that would have been two and a half months. But obviously, it never stops. You know, you've then got that huge summer break. In, in some ways, having a, a learning principal visit in September is, is a bit awkward because you've got time to forget um, and you've got to get you've got to crank back up into gear again in other ways the visitors know that and I think without sort of specifically making allowances for it they're prepared to be patient so you know we're all in this together aren't we it's not like an inspection um, these are our peers coming to help us to prompt questions so we, we took it in you know we, we took the leap of faith and said okay this isn't this isn't something that's going to be uh, you know like an inspection report where you can literally fail the school and there are huge consequences. This is about helping us to learn. Um, and, and we took that leap of faith and were rewarded by it, but it's still going on, you know, so it's, a, it's an ongoing. I'd, I'd say from day one, straight after the first meeting, conversations and reflections were taking place. And then that's incremental thereafter. If you keep the conversations going and you keep probing the reflections, then it will ultimately um, change classroom practice you know within the same sort of time frame you know half a term um, things start to change in the classrooms but I think from day one the conversations changed the tone of the conversations changed and if you can keep that momentum up that's got a real powerful um, message to it. I would, I would only add to that that um, the conversations have changed but and People have worked with these, but I think if you went to any one of our teachers and said, so t list the 10 learning principles and tell us what, you know, they, they wouldn't be able to do that, but they have, they're familiar with them now. But I think it's in a, to change the culture of a school, and, and also when you do look at it, it's like a different structure, a different language, it's going to take a while. We've made a decision that we're going to be doing from now on, all of our strategic planning will be aligned with the 10 learning principles so that... Uh, it becomes a part of the fabric of the school, uh, which is what we're, we're hoping for. Um, I would, I, I, you know, I, I don't know that we've seen um, 
a major change in the way teachers are teaching as a result of this, but I think part of that is we've only been reflecting at this point, and now we have a strategic plan with, we're supposed to have six to 10, but we're overachievers, so we have 12. Uh, you know, paths, that, and it is, it, it's two, multiple campuses, so it does, it does lend itself to being able to do a few more. But now those will be where we can start to measure whether or not we've, our action plans are gonna actually start to have an impact uh, with the learners. Thank you. Okay. Remember that, that schools really don't tell major learning plans until the end of their internal reflection process, yeah. and so we don't expect that those have been implemented already. The planning has just happened, so it's really, I think we're going to see the biggest amount of change a year or two years after that um, ERV visit occurs, and that'll be interesting to hear where you are in a year or two. If I can just add that one of the most powerful things for me is modeling. Um, just as we can be here today trying to, mo you know, looking at models of uh, people who've written reports before us, in terms of the teachers, um, they have all got different reading that they've done, they've done different research, that have experienced different things. And by going through the learning principles, they're now able to see a shared model of what it could look like. And it kind of gives them license to say, you know what, we could do this differently. And it gives them that ability to say, well, let's push the boat out and try it. Because now there is a common platform for what good could look like in a different context. Um, so I think the, the ACE model is a model in terms of showing the way and giving the teachers the, um, the right to say, let's try this and do it differently on the transformational scale. Mark, one last yeah, just from a, a practical standpoint, I've, I've done a number of learning principles visits. Two of them was very self-contained that the, the learning principles report was generated by the senior leadership team, essentially. The last one, there was a wider involvement in faculty, which changed the nature of the visit in itself. <coughs> How did you do it and just your thoughts, the preparation for the learning principles for this? Uh, you, there's a bit of structure, obviously. So um, the writing is done by the the mini committees, um, but I can honestly say it was a genuinely inclusive process, um, and probably not just the teachers either. You know, you can I've already mentioned you know, people like the dean of admissions had an insert not just to the foundational standards bit, but also to to the learning principles part. So it was an opportunity for us to expand that conversation slightly. You know, we weren't as I say we weren't talking to everybody in the community. Um, directly, but everybody had a chance to contribute to it. I can honestly say that was true. Yeah, we set up Google Docs, um, and so the committees could all contribute uh, and collaborate on a document. But everybody in other committees could also see what you know. If they were on LP3, they could see what was in the other learning principles. We've done round robin things like this, where the reports have then been disseminated, and people have used sticky notes to add comments and things like that. Um, Ultimately, it comes through the senior leadership team just for final editing and uh, consistency of language and you know capitalization and things like that. But the the base groundwork was all done through Google Docs. Ours was probably the the learning principles review wasn't I would say broadly processed. We made a decision. We we do the we do surveys every year anyway. So we had those surveys. We also had a task force that was working on what our reaction was going to be to Brexit because there was a, in Frankfurt, there's a large influx and we were trying to decide if we were going to expand or you know, how are we gonna to react to or respond to that. And so we had a lot of, we had done a lot of work there too, so we used that evidence. And so we kind of knew that when we did the learning principles, it was gonna be, um, this is sort of our impression as a leadership team of us. And then that when we did the rest of it, it would be much more inclusive sure. and, uh, and include the rest of the, the community. So that, and, it, and it, it worked out well that way. and, and it actually changed some of our thinking as we as we dove deeper into uh, over the course of this last year, the academic year.